Recording. Have a seat. Have a seat, man. All right. Let's get this rocking and rolling. Ladies and gentlemen, John Sullivan, Executive Director of the Free Software Foundation. Ooh. We've never actually met before. No. No. So awesome. Thanks, Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Sorry, let's roll in a little late here. Yeah, what's up with that? Uh, I have a little trouble finding the building. Yeah. I, I think Haskell's not really my, my thing. Am I the only? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this the only uh, like thing that's happening in this building? Is there any other like conference like thing sessions no. happening in this building? Yeah. Not until after. You're done. Yeah. Not until after I'm done. So this is my building. Yeah. <laughs> that makes it hard. This is my building. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I want to give. You guys a chance to ask John some questions because it's John, and you guys probably have questions. First, what do you do? What does the executive director of the Free Software Foundation actually do? Uh, so, I mean, the, the short version is I. You're making it up on the spot. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we have teams in basically four different areas. We have our uh, operations work that every organization needs. Uh, do our fundraising and uh, uh, take the organization function. We have our campaigns and advocacy work, which is one of the more visible parts of the FSF, doing things like the by design, uh, running our annual legal planning conference. Uh, we have the licensing team that helps people use GPL with other licenses and uh, does our enforcement work with GPL. Nice. And then we have our technical team, which provides infrastructure for lots of other free software developers and video projects in addition to running that infrastructure with the FSF needs. So I move between all those teams and help keep everybody, you know, eliminate obstacles of what they're trying to do, everybody working together. <coughs> um, then I do some speaking and, you know, uh, yeah, cool. representation. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. That. Some fundraising, of course. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so uh, we have to pay the bills and try to keep growing. Certainly the more people have gotten aware of things like surveillance and uh, of uses of technology over the last few years, our potential ambition and our potential scope is really huge. We need to try to hire you know, people to take that on. And, uh, awesome. I think it's a lot of my time. What, what is like the hierarchy of the Free Software Foundation? Like, in my mind, you're Stallman Fox. And I don't know if that's actually true or not. No, how does, how does that work? What's the, what's the hierarchy? I mean, executive directors are a pretty rad title. Like, <laughs> like it sounds awesome. Uh, it's the other way around. So I, I work for RMS and the board of directors. Because I had a uh, whole list of things I wanted you to tell Richard to do. <laughs> 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 this is a real big bummer for me. That's okay. I can, uh, you know, I, I can ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've tried to ask him. He doesn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, been, I've been working with them now for 13, 14 years all together. So really? Yeah, we have a good, good relationship, I think. And, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun working with someone that's very direct and you don't have to worry about them. Play with you and he's a very direct man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but very inspirational. And that's a big part of you know, why I'm still there. The, the organization has a really solid vision and, and mission, partly because it is you know really solid vision. It's pretty crystal clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he does not waver. Now, I last time I talked to him, I I was kind of talking around to a few things, and he he didn't like how non-specific I was about a few statements. He's like, wait a minute, and he kind of just laid into me. He's like, Acts down. You go specific on this. But yeah, he's he's hardcore. Yeah. yeah. So that's the uh, you know he's basically I'm in charge of the day-to-day -day operations and uh, also the kind of on an annual basis, like making sure that we meet our revenue goals. We don't spend too much money. Make sure we don't go over budget. Good we can't run a deficit. Um, and then uh, yeah, the hiring and the staff management and trying to keep all the work going. And then we rely more on uh, the board and environment for strategic vision and you know, uh, figuring out what our position is on new and complicated issues should be. Nice. Be no shorter than these days. No, no, no. What's, like, when you get up in the morning, what's, like, the one thing you like working on the most? Like, 
What's your What's your topic that you get fired up on? Well, I mean, it's not the top, it's not a topic, but uh, I get to work with really cool people and you know, surrounded by people that care about free software. And yeah, that's nice. Based on that time. That's so, all right. I, I mean, I guess you're not against free software, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember interacting with our members is always it's a lot of fun. We have like a very diverse people from all over the political spectrum, uh, involved in all sorts of occupations and professions. We have everybody from professional software developers all the way down to people who join and then are like, how do I install Greenlix or how do I use free software? So they actually join the organization before knowing anything about the software <coughs> using it. So I enjoy that aspect of it a lot. Um, more specific topics, uh, I, I'm personally really concerned about the vocal stuff and I've been following that space for close to for quite a while as an open vocal user and really want to have a fully free mobile Right now. What do you use? I have a replicant phone, which is a Samsung Galaxy Note 2. <coughs> uh, looks like any other phone these days. Yeah. Um, because it's only using free software, it's missing some pretty important functions like Wi Fi, GPS, <laughs> 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 Bluetooth. Uh, but it makes phone calls, it sends text messages, <coughs> and gets data over GSM. So it does it's something, yeah. The basic stuff, but we have a lot of work to do there, and that's one thing. Um, most concerned about. We have a lot of work to do there. I was, I was talking with uh, Bradley Kuhn over at the Freedom Conservatory, and uh, he, he did kind of does the same thing, but when he's out and about, and he kind of gets lost, and most people, you know, look up Google Maps or whatever, he can't, and so what he does is he makes a phone call to someone who he knows is at home sitting on a computer, and he's like, direct me there, where am I right now? And it just made me think, that's how it was like when we were kids. Like, except we didn't even have cell phones. We had to look around for a pay phone and, and find it. Like, I guess from your point of view, do you find it hard not having that functionality in your pocket? Like, when everyone else, when, like, when like that schmuck right there can just whip it out and be like, where is the donut shop? And you can just walk there directly, and you can just look around and go, well, the sky is blue, and supposedly donuts exist. It's, it's, it's frustrating. I mean, the, the worst is when, like, some of us, like, me and Bradley are out someplace together, and, like, neither one of us and can you can't help each other. It. Yeah. Um, but it's, there's trade-offs, you know, that doing without GPS means doing without anybody else knowing your location either. So I feel a little bit better about not, you know, participating in that system. So that, that's um, true. If you, at least if you get lost, you know, <laughs> no one else can hunt you down and find you. Right? <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> and also, like, with that specific case, OpenStreetMaps is uh, actually really nice. Um, and as long as, uh, so when I travel, usually I, I go and I download all the maps for yeah. the location that I'm going to, and then you have them online. That's kind of nice. Which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it works if you just can't say, where am I? <laughs> where am I? So look at times and figure it out. So that, that aspect has gotten better. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, part of why I'm in my role, I think, is because I'm very satisfied. I get a lot of satisfaction on small steps in my little bits of progress. If I was hoping for a complete victory. Year, I would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> so I like that we have been making, you know, Replicant, just recently I was able to update the uh, uh, version of Replicant on the phone to one that is only a few months behind regular Android. Yeah. So I have security updates and other stuff that we've been a little bit lacking on before that. And that's because a new contributor came along, really just a couple people, and have done, done a bunch of work on it. So that's, uh, the situation's so bad, but it's exciting to see something getting better. It, it kind of sucks that we have to say the situation's still bad. It, it, it seems like it shouldn't be at this point, but at, at least on the desktop, we're rocking. You know what I mean? It feels like, like right now we've got you know, that laptop, this laptop, that laptop, and that laptop are all recording this, all with free software. That's nice, and it's amazing that we can do all this video production stuff with just free software. But as soon as we put stuff in our pockets, we're just screwed. We just can't, we can't, yeah. like, we can all, we can make phone calls. But even then, half the time, the baseband is all closed yeah, on top of it. So, do you think, do you think it's something that will actually get to the point where we can have that fully free phone in our pockets sometime soon? What do you think? I think that the way forward might have to be pretty radical um, reformulation of the whole infrastructure because if you think about a cell phone, as soon as we had a fully free phone with free based and firmware, the phone companies could just kick it off the network and not allow it on the network at all. 
Um, and so I feel like the way forward has to do with a different kind of network uh, access. So, for example, a fully free portable device um, and a uh, move to have open Wi-Fi access points. You know, you know, like a big wedge network or something, yeah. Uh, that, that can work, at least for a lot of uses, and maybe could expand over time until... Do you think it's possible? Do you think, like, in our current setup, is that something that's actually happening? I do, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, the, the open Wi-Fi movement has some traction. You know, EFF was campaigning behind it for a while. Yeah. yeah. And we're kind of ready to get more behind it because now we have a, a, a Wi-Fi router uh, that is running only free software. Yeah. And so we have a it's certified on our, on our respective freedom on our certification program. So we have a, a router that we can promote to people that could be sold and configured with an appropriate setup to have a private network for your home use and a public network that was uh, shared with everybody. So it obviously starts in like more urban and dense areas. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's where you know, a lot of people live. New York City has more people in the 39 states in the U.S. than uh, a lot of people in Europe live in much closer proximity to each other. Than, uh, than there. So it, I think it's possible <coughs> that's the way to start. And then something the, has the changed on a larger scale. Lot, but yeah. Well, you know, we don't want to leave. They're also, in many cases, out of luck now. Um, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> and also, let's not forget that in my apartment in downtown Durham, North Carolina, I have no cell phone service. So Seriously? Yeah, it's... How is that exactly. even possible? Yeah. This is like a third world here? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, where US, are you? You're here in Canada, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> the US situation for network coverage is not, and for broadband, is not good anyway. So, That's true. Yeah, keep that in mind. But um, I, I'm hoping that we see some movements like this catch on, then that can influence the broader you know, national and international conversations about infrastructure. 5G is kind of gone the wrong way already, but uh, maybe other things you know, the next time. But you think, yeah, 60. We'll just skip to 60. Right. We, we don't need 5G. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, had, I've had this conversation with, with, with Richard a couple of times, and he and I kind of see eye to eye and kind of don't. So I'm curious your thoughts on this. Within free software, so for example, just to get a baseline, um, on your home machine, what, what are you running? Are you running a Linux distribution, or are you running Herd? Like, what are you running? I use Skinner Linux. I use both um, Debian with only the main repository enabled, which is also software, and then I use uh, distribution Yepstep and Dorsey, which is Triscoll. Triscoll, yeah. yeah. And that's also all free software. And I use a uh, X200 ThinkPad, which has replaced the BIOS with a free BIOS called LibreBoot. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the de facto, if I want a LibreBoot machine, people go to those. Yeah. Those particular think that's yeah. hopefully the F two twenty might be available uh, in the yeah. so. yeah. <laughs> more options is good. Yeah, that's what I use. So so with that in mind, if we're looking towards adoption of like free software across the world, <coughs> free software for the world, where is the, the place for compromise in all of that? So like if I go to a company and I'm like I want to promote free software. Well, let's just say I go to the building. I go have a meeting with Adobe, and I'm like, great, I want to convince them to release all of the creative suite under the free software license, under some free software license. I know, high in the sky. But let's say I go there, and I get a little bit. Like, they come back and they're like, well, we'll release some of it under, like, an MIT license, and a little bit under a BSD license, and then we'll, we'll call that good for now. Where is the room for compromise in those situations? Do Is that... Is that a victory and that should be celebrated, or, or is that just not far enough to be to be happy with? Or is there a problem with that? What are your views along those lines? I think it depends a lot on the actual specific issue. I mean, if they if they were to release uh, you know one program under every software license, I think we would celebrate that, even if they didn't release the rest yeah, of yeah. the program. So I think that's usually something we can celebrate. I think where it gets trickier is when that seems to be done as a way to uh, bring more people into the proprietary software. So sometimes uh, that, that we might not applaud so much that the company is releasing something that's free, but its only purpose is really to be a user of some other proprietary uh, software or some service that you, you know, they could do something. In the Adobe example, <laughs> so much of it is being done as uh, software as a service or yeah. service as a software substitute. Now they could release a free client whose only purpose was to interact with these Services. These services, and, you know, yeah. and that's not any game because the user still doesn't have control over the software that they're actually relying on. Mm -hmm. on the server. It's not technically for 
proprietary is just not distributed at all. Right, right. The effects for the user are still the same. You can't see the source code. You can't modify the source code. You can't ask anybody else to look at the source code for you. You can't share copies of it. So it depends what, you know, we definitely celebrate partial steps. But, you know, are they really partial steps or are they sort of like, this might look good if we did this, you know. Right. Do you, within your own personal computing life, do you have any, like, places where you're comfortable making compromises? Like, for example, again, all my video production and my work, all free software, but I like video games uh -huh. a lot. And so I have a boatload of closed and proprietary video games. It's my, like, it's like my vice. Like, it's my little shame. And uh, I would call it my secret shame, except they tell it about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, do you have do you have a place like that where you're like, okay, you know what? I'm free software for this, this, and this, but I just really need that this bad. Like, like, what's your what's yeah, your I thing mean, there? You know, I want that. That's not really what I'm what I'm up, up to brag about. Uh, <laughs> 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 but I also, you know, I recognize that I'm surrounded by family members, uh, you know, friends that use proprietary software for some things. Yeah. Um, and nobody can exist in the world without, in a, well, you can live off the grid, but if you're participating in uh, you're using ATM machines and going to restaurants, right? Uh, you know, you have to like type in the tip on the tablet and send it back around. It's like we're all like interacting with at least other people's proprietary software all the time. And that's, uh, that's kind of inevitable. You can't really escape from that. And so it's different, you know, it's different from making the choice yourself to have it and to rely on it. Uh, I don't subscribe to Netflix. I, say that. I did used to subscribe when it was a DVD. When it was a DVD okay. service, yeah. yeah. So we're trying to get them to drop DRM uh, and stop trying to convince the WGC to have DRM built into HTML on their behalf. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize that it's, you know you can subscribe to Netflix and still try to convince them to drop DRM. Some people would say you might have a louder voice uh, as a customer in that case. But uh, maybe okay. You know, yeah. it's fine for people. Uh, people shouldn't. People should try to do better. Oh, we should try to yeah. be the change that we want to see and everything. But it's also we shouldn't get down on each other too much for uh, feeling compelled to make certain choices. <coughs> that doesn't mean that it's the right state of affairs. Like, just because Great. people feel a lot of pressure to have Netflix now in order to participate in like uh, you know, conversations and relationships uh, doesn't mean that the way that Netflix does business is okay. Right. And still complain about it. So I hope if you are a subscriber, you still be raised plus about it and still do, you know, push for better arrangements. Right. Yeah, I, I like free software. I'm not a big fan of Microsoft's business practices, but I need Minecraft really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one, right? Because Minecraft is, like, so close to teaching people about free know. software. You know, kids learn to code uh, oh. and the excitement <laughs> of, like, building things. But then you just hit that wall. Where, you hit that wall, man. Yeah, yeah. So but look I mean, behind the curtain again. How much money has Minecraft made? Is it anyone that's like, it's like a bajillion dollars? It's insane <laughs> how much money it's made. But yeah, it's, it's right there. It's close to being this perfect open utopia where we can have learning and education and gaming and blocks, and it's wonderful. But yeah, uh, it's test, right? For you. Yeah, there's mind tests. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's, but not everyone already. Plays it, yeah, and it doesn't right. play as well, and and it's it's not the same. It's yeah. not the one that they have the toys for in the store that my daughter can get excited about. You get the big foam sword with the edges on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 really rough. So merchandising is rough. Yes. When you wear <laughs> 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 little stall dolls, we have stuff to do. The booth, you know, right over there, you can go get a little. See, yeah. the problem with the stuff the news uh, <laughs> is, is I, every time I point to, like, the, the GNU logo, yeah. at least within this world, herd comes up. Uh, and then and then it becomes a little bit of a running gag, because when will I have herd? When will herd function? And then, and then we just kind of giggle about it and move on. Uh, <laughs> herd? No. Uh, no, we, we had um, a machine running herd in the office before. Uh, it's a very interesting experience yeah. like, because a lot of the stuff that you're used to working in uh, a system with someone external doesn't yeah. work the same way. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of fun to play around with. You've got Emacs you know, running on it. It's fine. Uh, it's but basics. You know, I will say, like, the herd, the herd still has active contributors. I think a lot of people learn um, about kernel programming by working on their herd. 
Which is cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a really cool group of people that are still working on it, and uh, some of the more fun people that I know in the new project to uh, talk to. You. So even if you, you know, it's not going to replace Linux anytime soon, um, but if you're looking for a project to hang out in and, and learn some low-level programming stuff, it's mm -hmm. pretty neat. But there are there are kernel things happening in the world, and I think that's a little bit scary for us because the reason that the herd wasn't as much of a priority was because Linux came along and was one of the GPL and it did the job that needed to be done with free software. But now, you know, there's talk of uh, rumors about Google wanting to change the kernel on Android. Uh, there's uh, another Google kernel project uh, for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the Linux Foundation actually has a, uh, another kernel for Wait, embedded stuff. Really? Yeah. Um, so I think the world there might be some changes in that area over the next several years. You think so? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's not exactly a stagnant thing. It's all constantly moving, so maybe. Yeah. I try to stay out of the market speculation. That is like, <laughs> especially. And our, our vision is like, you know, you're, you're going to have to say the same things every time something new happens. Is it free software? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it locks down in any way, can people actually change it? You gotta go back to the talking point, yeah. man. You gotta stick to it. Well, they're the principle, you know. That's the principle. I, 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 I gotta say, for Richard Stallman, probably gets a, a fair bit of flack for many things with, within the world, but he's the most consistent spokesman for the topics he talks about. Every time I've talked to him, he, no matter what question I ask him, he's the most practiced politician in that way. He comes right back to how does this relate to the four freedoms? How does this relate exactly to it? And it is both infuriating when I talk to him <laughs> and just absolutely amazing because you can't, you cannot, you cannot deviate from that. It's I don't know how he manages it. Cause I get I get sidetracked. I see a person with a laptop over there. And I, I'm shiny. I want to talk about that now. You can't do that. With him. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, no, with Mark and I'm, I'm all over the place talking about stuff. He's always you know, keeps the focus. And, it does. Uh, it does. The four freedoms were a really brilliant and concise way of expressing what the yeah. what the parameters need to be. Yeah, even though if you started the numbering with zero, which is which is incorrect, I'm sorry. I, I grew up programming in basic. It starts with one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, would you mind if we take a few questions? We got. Sure. You know, I figure we got lots of stuff here. Um, does anyone have any questions for the executive director of the Free Software Foundation? All right. <laughs> what do you want, Fedora? <laughs> I have, <laughs> I've added moving some graphical to Fedora. Well, my question is kind of along the lines, right? I was asking you maybe a little broader. Um, do you think the, the kind of end victory for free software is even possible anymore? When Richard started out, software was kind of this niche. There was you could almost put your hands around all the software in the world. Yeah. And now the software is everything. Everything has software in it. And maybe you disagree with me on this, but to me the trajectory isn't going in free software space. There's more and more free software all the time, like this. But there's more and more software all the time with this. So do you think the free software foundation can ever actually achieve like the freedom of all software anymore? And I guess if not, what what should it attempt to achieve as best it can? I still I still think it's possible. Yeah, basically. Um, I think mm -hmm. that but there's different it's more complicated than just software also right uh, it's become apparent that just the license freedom of the software what that really means is the freedom of the user when they're interacting with the software. And so more freedoms work really well for the software that you have control over. You know, it's just something that you are interacting with in a way that it's possible to have control over. But I think that we see, you know, the, because you have free software, doesn't mean your freedoms are being affected in a lot of cases. So uh, one thing that I've been talking about a lot Investment one view is we have to make sure that free software does not become a way to sell proprietary software more effectively and cheaper. Because you know every exciting technological development of the last you know, 20 years is that free software involved. You know, Kindle, yeah. that's, you know, ebook readers all have free software. Android phones, or free software. The iPhone, you know, look at the about section and see how many times the free software foundation name pops up. Uh, a lot of LGPL software in there. Thank you for the iPhone, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to pass that along to Richard. We really appreciate all the hard work you guys did for iOS. I'm not supposed to do that with my employee discount stuff. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and then network, you know, software that's not running on any kind of mobile device represents different freedom bounds. <coughs> so it, it, my answer is yes, I think we can get all the software to be um, free software. I think that there's, that's, for one thing, there's so much commercial justification for that, aside from the social justification, that it could really happen. But then does that solve all of the human freedom problems that stem from interacting with ubiquitous computers? Like, you know, Free software can have security problems. Free software can even have malware built into it until someone takes the trouble to actually pull it out. So a whole culture has to develop around that to respect people's freedom. And yeah. with free, free software is the foundation of the baseline. And then we have to do other stuff on top of that to still accomplish what our real goals are. Some of those things are more challenging because they involve interacting with governments. Free software we can do to a large extent on our own. That was kind of easier with government support. But you felt that changing political system to public system. Is yeah. the Dora project calling for a revolution in the government? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard from. It's sort of like the like the W three C DRM proposal, right? I mean, it's, even if the software itself that powers it is released under a free software license, it's still powering the ability to restrict content from being used by people, and that's counterintuitive to what we would kind of, what we'd like to see. So, uh, yeah, or you know, that's why one of the big reasons for GPLv three was to prevent people from taking free software and putting on a device that had a signature check when it booted. So if you modified the software, yeah. uh, it wouldn't boot anymore. The keyboardization stuff. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's still a concern, you know. The, uh, it's interesting, when you, people sort of, most people seem to be aware that an iPhone, uh, the only thing that's stopping you from running Android on an iPhone is Apple. So like, it's technically possible. Uh, people have even done it. But in the general public mindset, or if you feel like you know, the iPhone can only run Apple because they can only run Apple. You know, what, it's got an Apple on it. I don't need choice to tell <laughs> what else would I do with it. Well, there's a lot more things you could do with it if it were illegal. Yeah. It, it's like the early, the early iPods didn't necessarily have all the... They weren't as good at restricting it yeah. in the early days, so people could put free software players on old iPod hardware. Right. And that was awesome. that was cool. I had, I had one of those. When it became available, I bought a used old iPod just so I could do that. I never used it. Fedora <laughs> and uh, audio stuff. We can all cheer for the MP3 patents expiring. Yes. Uh, yeah. Decoding admin coding as of like yesterday. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to see distros all across the land yeah. shipping with that pretty shortly here. <laughs> it's delightful. Uh, all right, hands up. What do we got? You good, sir. What's your annual budget? Annual budget. Uh, we are been going up um, every year. We are in the neighborhood of like 1.2. Uh, million yeah. and revenue is exceeded that. So, in, in sort of, I can kind of, I won't go too far because then you speak out about like general nonprofit management and finance stuff. But yeah. um, we, our charity navigator score is 99 point something out of 100, and that's partly because we have uh, over a year in reserves of operating expenses. So, really, yeah, all fundraising could. That's uh, impressive. It's not an excuse not to donate, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody take a year off. No, it's just a, it's, it's good, I think, for an organization like the to have, to be able to continue. We do controversial things sometimes. We upset, you know, corporate donors sometimes. Uh, so, so having a little in reserve is good yeah. for when you have those, those dry months. <laughs> and there's some big, you know, free soft, some legal battle related to free software. We have something to start with. We have yeah, to raise more money than that to, yeah. to win that. But we have uh, something to build on there. And we were listed... And uh, you know, number nine and charity navigators, ten charities to uh, watch out for. Really? It's generic. Who, who's charities. number eight? Who beat you? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to give them any prep. No, okay. I'm <laughs> say an animal thing or something. <laughs> what sort of what sort of what's the ratio between like personal private citizen donation and like corporate or big organizations So we're over eighty percent individuals. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. We don't. Uh, we we want more you know, your employers. Please you know, ask them to join our patron program and donate. But um, we definitely want to make sure that we can do any of those contributions and not, you know, yeah, not die. Change. And that's really important for our organization to maintain our independence and sovereignty that way. It's really nice to rely on individuals. More. Yeah, you don't want to think that yeah, like eighty percent of your budget comes from intel or something like that. That just see every everyone would come up with a conspiracy theory around that. Right? Yeah, so that just would be no good. Oh, what do we got? Was that a question or was that just a stretch of the hand?
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're worried about, the again, that's the organization provision. Um, and, but, you know, it's short-sighted because there's a lot of other stuff that's better about the D3 family of licenses, uh, the provisions to kick in when you actually violate the license that are much uh, more reasonable and much easier to work with. In order so to this is more than the Texas that you feel as well as the Texas Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, Sunday, uh, tomorrow, at the end of the day, I'm, my talk is about the kind of general state of copyleft and whether it's increasing or decreasing, whether more people or less people are using GPL. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that. Yeah, there has. I, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. But you mind delving into that very briefly, even though you talk tomorrow. We won't go too deep. That way, everyone has a reason to actually go to that. Um, so there has been like there's been a couple of like articles here and there and whatnot. Uh, even one of my friends wrote an article along those lines that you know adoption of GPL is decreasing, whereas adoption of some of the other licenses is kind of on the way up. Nice graphs show of that and everything like that. What's what's the Free Software Foundation's take on that? Is that happening? Is that not that critical? Is that being misunderstood? So I think you know, the really key points are, I mean, the first one is just that the information that, that the claims that have been circulating uh, are based on is not real information. So Are you saying it's uh, fake news? All right. <laughs> 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 No, it's, uh, it's, so it's coming from companies like uh, Black Duck, uh, is a big one, who they say they do license analysis, but they don't publish the software that they use to do that work, and they don't publish the data set. And so, you know, if you're making a claim that's essentially a, a scientific claim, that we looked at this body of software and found that this many programs are under this license, and this program is under that license, yeah. uh, the fact that nobody else can reproduce that or inspect their work not very, uh, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk on Sunday about uh, about why, because just as an example, when you count two programs, when you're counting five programs, see what licenses they have. One of the programs is Emacs. Let's say uh, another program is uh, an app to interact with a single service. That's like, a big difference there. Like, are you counting yeah. those two things as equal? You know, Emacs is under GPL, a uh, single purpose, single service app is under um, uh, permissive license. Right? Right. Is that one to one? Uh, and then there's the fact that are you counting versions of different operating systems more than once? Right. It's a lot of complications. So it's just important that people have to be able to inspect where the information is coming from and verify it. <coughs> the other thing is just uh, what, is it, what does it mean? I mean, if yeah. you're talking about people make licensing decisions for a variety of reasons, even the FSF recommends that the uh, first criteria is if you're contributing to an existing project, use the license the project is already used. Right? So it's not clear that just even if copyleft were less popular for new projects, mm -hmm. that really means any of the things that people are saying. Right. Right? Like, the GPL is doomed. It's in the decline. It's, like, it's coming from both MIT people. MIT will win. It's coming from people who want that to happen, but it's also coming from people that are pro-copyleft. Free BSD users. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the answer, that brings up another point, which is to everybody should remember that it's all free software. So uh, we have to consider things with the license to be still free software. Right. It's just still good. It's just not GPL. <coughs> it's just not as good in the long term because you can't rely on it staying free software. And uh, the other weird thing that's not mentioned in these articles is what the proprietary share is. So I don't know why people talk about this as a trade off between as if there's a zero sum amount of software. <laughs> And sixty percent of it is GPL and forty percent of it is permissive license. Like no, the pool of software is growing all the time, right. um, and it's been very possible and likely that part of the reason that uh, there might be more permissive license software is because there's less proprietary software because those companies are choosing to make some of it more available, whereas they wouldn't have in, in ten years ago. I wonder, if, do you know if if there is data that you guys have seen on on proprietary software licensing growth or decline or anything like that? Not that I can, no, not that I can cite. Um, I will present a little bit better data uh, that's drawn from reproducible sources yeah. on Sunday about uh, GPL. But um, I say it's up to no one is looking at that whole picture all together. You know, yeah, around. I don't really know any way to do it other than you look at like the big app stores and like how you can get credit. And even then, that's kind of waffly. Yeah, that's yeah. fine too, because the um, app stores tend to not tell you what the license is. Not usually, yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. Oh boy. Mr. Man in the middle. Nice seat, by the way. Yeah. Um, my question is um, 
what is your take on when you have a clash of license, licensing on a single platform? The uh, example that comes to mind is like wanting to add ZFS or DFS into the Linux. So if so, if you wanting to, to take a free is software it, platform and put on no, no, no. The conflict, the like one's ESP license, one is VPL. Obviously, you can't ship it with the module on top. You can tell it the DFS module and put it into Linux as an individual. I just wonder what your take on the future, because you're going to have conflicts between free licenses at some point at, at the application. What's your take on? Yeah, so your question is referring to a situation that happened last year with uh, DFS, which is under the license called CDDL, um, which is a free software license, but it's incompatible with GDL. And uh, people wanted to ship a DFS module for Linux, which is under GDL. So uh, a module for a program is almost always a derivative work of the parent program. And so you can't combine, you can't do, you can't have incompatible licensing on those two parts. Right. So either Linux needed to be under the CDDL, um, or ZFS needed to be under the GPL. Right. And those conflicts are tough because they're both free software. And so on one hand, it seems really lame to say, well, uh, you can't put it together. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, you know, why not just fix it? Right? Like if, if the state, there are people who can't fix it. Oracle has, uh, you know, same copyright interest. But uh, DFS area that they could you know, get a license exception or relicensing. So it's Oracle's uh, fault. Well, you know, I, those <laughs> things on it. That's, that's where I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but step back, the, the broader point is that this stuff needs to be written down so that everybody's playing by the same rules. Uh, and so developers who don't have access to legal advice uh, can't pay a lawyer. Or can yeah. still participate in the free software economy and, and community and not. You know, bigger companies can say, well, we can ship DFS and Linux together because we've been told by all the key people that they won't sue us yeah. for doing this. But a developer who doesn't have access to alerts, it's not really a safe bet. Right. And, uh, well, I think the risk. But just the, uh, the precedent is also concerning in that case that um, because we are trying to, uh, everybody, I think, wants companies to ship modules for Linux to release them as free software. There's, under the GPL, there's debate about you know, whether it's a violation in every case to not do that. But I think everybody's ideal world in the, you know, is to have all that stuff to be, uh, you know, put it under licenses that work together. Don't set a precedent that it's undermining the skills of yeah. uh, copy that. Just uh, have you know, one specific feature. Reasonable. Yes. So, uh, pick up. We talked about project. That. Huh? Diaphragm. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> we talked about uh, the phones. Doctor, I wrote a, wrote a short story. Yeah, it's, it's basically like a modern version of uh, Stephen King's Carrie, except for it was yeah, modern cars. Yeah, uh, it was good. So I expect both companies to make that same argument. You, know, you, you can't 
can't have free modem firmware on our network because yeah. users will use it to send spam, uh, to transmit you know, viruses now, where and create botnets on our network. Uh, I expect that maybe I'd be proven wrong. I don't have a specific example of one of but that broader yeah. trend is what I think. Right. The Volkswagen has already demonstrated that proprietary software and cars is demonstrated. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> we'll yeah, still get around it. Thing. We put them under electron microscopes, we scan the E-proms, we drill in, we tap them, and then we take the software out and change it. You are a crazy man. For <laughs> 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 the reason that they keep it. Uh, it's a represent. <laughs> it's an argument we try to make to the company is that, you know, the more tightly you control the software on the car, the more liable you are yeah. for whatever goes wrong with it. Don't claim to have that control, then things will be as they largely always have been, which is people are going to make up things on the Back up by ten feet that they roll over on a turn, like they're responsible for that. And we need to we want those things to not happen. But it's, it's not some it's not as much of a view uh fear as the industry is thinking it out. People have been modifying their cars for a long time. Yeah. Um, the important thing is that, that <coughs> society and governments have rules about transportation that are enforced uh, at the point of use, I think, rather yeah. than at the uh, why are we using copyright for a traffic case? That's, that's not what it was designed for ever. <laughs> I do so, like the idea, you know, though. Yeah, well, they tried to. It's ridiculous. Try to. They tried to use copyright for um, the EPA because the Volkswagen stuff was arguing against exemption, exemptions to the DMCA. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's copyright is now being used to try to leverage all sorts of different social and government goals that it was never designed to be a good tool for ever. What's up, Portland? So, hey, uh, now that we have WebKit in our cars, well, and, uh... I like where this question's going already. WebKit in the cars. All right. This is a terrible idea. All right, so, um, WebKit needs security updates very frequently, like right. any browser. The lifetime of a car in development is five to ten years, and then they really only <coughs> track the car for five years after the last line of that production, so maybe 10 years. So you may have like 15 year span of Where people you, at the company manufacturing the care on the car. Like might actually update the website. Right, like might the actually car. ensure you, there is a right. website update. And Very whether or not you get that over the air, whether or not you take it to a dealership, do the private industry get access to the same updates, update the car if you go to an independent repair shop. The reality is these things are all exploitable. And we're relying on the security boundary between, say, your navigation unit that has the web kit and the rest of the car. Right. At some point in time, I need to be able to protect myself after the manufacturer no longer cares. How do we go about and ensure that the manufacturers are responsible, at least after their own fiduciary duty to take care of these systems, so that we have the ability to be our own mechanics afterwards? Can we get them to put the code in escrow so that when my warranty expires, I get access to the firmware tools? Is there anything we can do to go after them? Enable us so, to take care of our own purchases. So in short, how do we how do we protect our rights to modify, work on, and support our equipment right. on our own without without their corporation being involved? Well, after they no longer care or have the tooling to do it, so they, they de tool we, after we they be, I, At least I, I feel like we have to be careful not to say things like after they no longer care because then they could say, well. I care about being copyrighted on my like, copyright on Mickey Mouse for the next 127 years. But, but, right, but <laughs> your copyright is no longer a security issue, right? If I'm driving down the road and the Bluetooth stack in my car gets exploited, to be able to talk to the CAN bus, to be able to change turn signals and things, right? Um, you know, there's a safety issue. So there are copyright like you what, need to what's going like for safety or copyright? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I built, I built monster Audis and Volkswagens, and I would say exactly. drive cars that aren't computers. Yeah, I'm kind of with you there. What, 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 what are your thoughts? I'm not saying that there is, to be on the most the United States, the right to repair for shops. Yeah. So that might play into it. Yeah, that was kind of the first. But, uh, I think the first thing that we needed to do as an organization is yeah, that's just to uh, make some relationships and work better with the right to repair movement. That's been getting a lot of steam because that's. Uh, those things are coming together now. The cars are computers, and you, know, you need free software in order to be able to repair them. But I, I, I'm sure there are a variety of approaches. The one that we're most interested in is to get them to make the software available from the beginning, as free software, 
and enable users to install modified versions or to you know, pay a shop to install a modified version. And you know, that does come with some new challenges that are different from the challenges that come from not doing that. But there's no challenge-free approach for cars. They kill people. Uh, and with have seen when they don't publish the source code, you know, that voice that was uh, going around for the luxury cars, being able to open anybody's car door uh, electronically. But if you don't have the source code available, then people don't find out about that uh, soon enough. And on top of that, once they find out about it, there's nobody to fix it for them yeah. except for one company. So the first way to not have companies abandon you in the long term is to try not to depend on them exclusively from the beginning. And that's, I think, that's what we're trying to communicate to people about Apple phones. Like, there's no argument that, that iOS is uh, more secure and in important ways than your typical Android phone, but that comes at the expense depending on a single company. Right. And that's not uh, so similarly, you know, cars need to get away from the model of relying on one company to uh, provide code, lots of modified. Do you think that that it's even doable, like within the within the government, you think they would take action on those lines until something bad happens? It always seems like it takes like a horrible act, like some someone killing kids or something, and then all of a sudden government's on it. Like we need iPhones to start murdering people. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or when we talk about like, the right to repair law, like, like okay, if we're talking about uh, you know uh, a, a new BMW, well, and then it gets kind of murky. It's like, well, BMW is you know they, they making money. What a good corporation! It's like almost like we need an IoT machine gun on a whole bunch of people's front lawns to suddenly go bad because they weren't updating it anymore, and then everyone has rights to repair. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rights to repair is good. All right, we have, I just finished. It. Charles Strauss book where the, the plot was surveillance cameras that were taken over um, by a network exploit and, and used to murder people. So, uh, I'm telling you, it's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't we have enough like dystopian fiction out there that we don't need it to actually have that? There are IoT controlled gas ovens. <laughs> what? Well, <laughs> gas <laughs> That's a real thing. This happened. We had everything happen with uh, IoT and you know, the DNS servers being. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And that, that actually relates to the point that you're making about cars, which is these devices, you know, the cable boxes and the DVRs and the things that everybody, those things get dropped like that for a very short period of time. There's no capability for users to install security updates on them themselves. And so that really shows the degree to which it's involved, like a public health problem. And, and, you, know, you can have your own, every, you can, everything in my house can be free software, but I can still get attacked by all of the things that are affected, right? You know, everybody else's boxes. So that's like, the social thing, it's a public health problem, and it's, we can either try to make the companies be responsible, um, or we can just make sure that we don't have to depend on them being responsible. <coughs> that people are free to go to third parties or use their own technical acumen to fix their own problems. Do you think companies will be responsible? The, currently, the, the projected estimate is 75 billion IoT devices over the next uh, seven to eight years. With that much money, that is going to be made. Do you think that companies would care about being responsible? No. It seems like it's a cash grab, so yeah. why not just run with it? Well, we have. So uh, Matthew Garrett is someone who's done a lot of security research on these devices and writes some very entertaining um, descriptions of the results. His Amazon reviews are amazing. Yes. No one reads Matthew Garrett's Amazon comments. He'll buy like an IoT light bulb and he'll just lay into it. It is amazing. So I had to read some products have been removed from, yeah. from Amazon as well as been produced. Um, so you know, more people doing that, like that's what it takes, I think. It's embarrassing companies. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe that's mean. You don't like embarrassing people getting the information out there. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's fun. Yeah. I think when someone leaves the default password, uh, uh, the is down still on the device and yeah. has it open a telnet port by default to the entire world, yes. probably deserves to be embarrassed a little bit. A little bit. Uh, the uh, hotel post was a, a really great one about how you need uh, hotels that have tablets in every room now. Uh, it turns out. What was they had IP addresses assigned by room number? IP address is room number. Uh, Nothing could go wrong with that, though. It's not that hard. They have a couple tablets that make their curtains go up and down, and they always come on and off. And then, uh, so, 
I need to do that one of these days. <laughs> um, uh, if someone had their hand up, were you, you still? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. you mentioned like, you know, some kind of large catastrophe because the government to take action. Do you think that the government will open things up more or close things down? Right. Yeah. So we have two different you know, we have evidence for both sides of that. We have the way the EPA reacted, like I mentioned, um, to uh, stuff like Volkswagen and they want things to be more locked down. The FCC had a, done some things in a similar fashion. Yeah. Uh, but we had a really good conversation going with the Department of Defense over the last few months. And they're releasing projects. They released a project on the AGPL. Uh, nice. And it was not only you know, a piece of software, great to have to be free, but it was a piece of software that uh, is involved in the court martial system, huh. where the defendant really had an interest in being able to see like, the software that's involved in. Yeah. So it's not only like a uh, use of free software by the government, it's a really cool and ethically motivated use of free software by the government. So I think they could, I think the default reaction right now is still to want to close things down and, and exercise control. But we see signs of uh, things, possibilities in other directions. The White House, uh, the Federal Source Code Policy that got published uh, last year as well was a step in the right direction. It's a step. Yeah. And it turned out to be a pretty small step. And it, Flag the pilot program. So, you know, one thing that, that we can do as citizens uh, is try to participate in the free software projects that the government is tentatively putting out there. But the big part of the opposition is always, why should we bother? Like, even for cases where they don't really think there's a reason why they have to keep it um, unpublished. You know, why yes. should they go through the work of, like, running a project? Why should they go through the work of dealing with other people's requests? Participating in the project is one way to, to help uh, get a positive reinforcement for it, to know that it produces benefits and it can actually solve problems. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, if we if we all like banded together and picked like two or three of those opened up projects and just made them awesome yeah. and contributed to them and tested them and gave them back and were able to demonstrate how much money they saved to their constituents, then they want to do more because they want to get reelected and save yeah. money. Put that money uh, somewhere else that we probably also don't want to spend. It. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, the only problem with government. You know, that, that seems like a good way to go. How much time do we have left? We have five minutes. Ah, all right. Does anyone have a really good question? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mr. Man, with the best question of the day. Well, I just want to kind of continue on your discussion here with the uh, IoT devices and Telnet. So, the two companies involved, Lightning like and Dawa, make DVRs and security cameras. And 10 years before my botnet took over those devices, I contacted Dawa on Hypevision and said, look, you guys have got Telnet running on your, your devices here. It's wide open to the internet. It's going to get exploited. And, you know, 10 years later, it did. So their response to it was, well, we could try and write patches for these devices, but there's billions of them out there. How are we going to get them out to the consumer? The cons sure, the sure. It's the responsibility to... Devices. They should have bought new devices. Bought new devices, but yeah. you know, those are also running until that in 2017. <laughs> yeah. So it's a never ending battle. These, these vendors, they need to like, not just be cash grabs. That would be nice. It would yeah, be nice. Yeah, it'd be nice if they care more. Uh, yeah, I kind of mentioned it already once, but the. Uh, so we're trying, you know, I mentioned uh, briefly a certification program, and that's one. Uh, and any momentum, so we manufacture retailers send us products, we look at them, uh, we verify that they work with all free software, and they don't, uh, you can be able to modify the software using free tools, and then they get a market that they can play. And so right now, basically, it's been small companies participating, like Think Penguin and Technoethical, but we're getting some interest. You know, we're right now we're the backlog, but uh, we're the, the block that step has more applications coming in than we can get through. So that's one part of the solution is like positively reward companies that do the right thing and make it easy for people. You know, it's one thing to get people to care about free software at all, but even when you're convinced to care, it's like how do you act on that? Right? Like yeah. if you want to go buy a, a, a router that has only free software on it, you have to do a lot of work. You have to research and like, find one and, and verify the components and the drivers. And all the thing. Yeah, so yeah. one part that is like this is good. It's uh, I think a good part of the solution. All right, the, I want to end on, on this general thing. From the Free Software Foundation's point of view, if there was one project within the FSF right now that within the 
in the GNU that needs help, like that needs volunteers, that needs people working with, what would it, what would it be? Where's the where's the part where there's a shortage of manpower? So I'm gonna I'm gonna do the thing where I like to use my first wish to wish for three more wishes. <laughs> no, because we have a thing called the High Priority Project list on FFF.org. And uh, yeah, we, we recently went through a bigger vision and made it much smaller. Um, it was very large before we tried to actually do a better job about the priorities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, I'm just going to name my, my favorite you know, personal projects on there are the, um, the drivers for related to mobile hardware. You know, it's, yes. Uh, I shouldn't. We should be able to have a fully free device, and there's really a small number of components that either need to be supported via reverse engineering existing drivers uh, or writing new systems that yeah. support for them. So, and I'm going to put the second one in, which is decentralized, decentralized network services. So we have stuff like Media Goblin, you know, Social, Mastodon. Mastodon! Mastodon. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Who's using Mastodon? Right yeah. I want to use Mastodon. Uh, side note, uh, Mastodon, for those who don't know, is kind of like Twitter, except a little better design looking. It's decentralized, so it's like a federated system. Um, but it, it's all free software. So, beautiful. Beautiful. Highly recommend it. So that's the thing. That kind of two sides of the, the, the two major things here. We have, you know, on the stuff that you actually have control over, your laptop, your, your phone, we need to do the rest of the work to get those things to be all free. Yeah. That's the driver stuff. And then we need to confront the new challenge where it doesn't matter what software is running because you don't even have it yeah. on your computer. Yeah. Awesome. All right. John, thank you, man. John Sullivan. Uh, I don't know what's happening next. I'm in here. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. <laughs>